I would like us to discuss what originally drew us to the ideas of liberty, seeing as we'll be talking about how the youth aren't drawn to liberty, yet here we are talking about, you know, liberalism. I would like for us to, at the very least, know, I'll start with myself, of course, as to what, you know, drew us to liberty. For me, personally, I have always cared about my environment, really. I was quite inquisitive, so I would always ask questions as to why things are the way that they are. So I'd ask questions, why are the poor people, why are the rich people? Why are the people who seem to have more resources than other people do? Why are the things the way that they are? In a social context, right, outside of, you know, natural phenomena, because I'm not so great in the natural hard sciences. But, you know, this journey of asking what, uh, what makes things the way that they are led me down a path of, you know, firstly, political economy and, but uh, more broadly, uh, being concerned with policy and how the state in particular impacts people's lives. So I started off in the black consciousness movement because I cared about, you know, at the very least, I was surrounded by black people where I grew up in and I wanted to solve their predicament, being ambush ambitious as I was, because, you know, I thought at the very least I could solve all the problems that existed in the world. So I was drew to that and the black consciousness uh, philosophy at the very least in South Africa is largely associated with uh, radical leftism so that also accompanied Marxism and I was drew to Marxism too I read a whole lot of Marx I read you know a whole lot of Lenin and Mao and Chair and you know all the, all these uh, Marxist thinkers and in my quest to at the very least solve these problems I kept on encountering how in the application of these Marxist ideals every time they are broached you know mass carnage ensues even though whilst you are within it you try to close yourself off to the mass carnage but you know mass carnage ensues and that I continued down that path trying to figure out at the very least how I can you know use whatever intellectual capacity I have to help people that look like me and everyone in general but you know most definitely myself and people that look like me because those are the people I was exposed to growing up and in that quest I got exposed to one of the greatest liberal thinkers from the United States and Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams specifically. Walter Williams has a wonderful book called The State Against Black. It wasn't the only book that influenced me but was seeing at the very least someone who looked like me argue against ideas that I was quite a huge proponent of was really took me aback and you know I read Walter Williams The State Against Black and I read Thomas Sowell and I eventually led, landed on Rothbard's Ethics of Liberty. From there I never looked back because you know I tried to at the very least I had finally found an application of a, a, a solution to all the problems I was looking for and the solution really unlike you know my social engineering ambitions lied in giving people liberty giving people freedom and letting them figure out you know how best they can improve their lives because I'm sure just like as I was thinking how best I can improve my life everyone else had those thoughts so if they can have the latitude to pursue those thoughts to their full to their fulfill to their fulfillment I think there will be a much more better place so that's what drew me to, you know, these ideas. Um, I'll, you know, hand it over to my panel. Pila will tell us what drew him to the ideas of liberalism. Yeah, I mean, just listening to, well, first of all, uh, pardon me for being rude. Thank you for the wonderful uh, introduction, Martin. Thanks for the kind uh, 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 invitation, David. It's great to be here. Um, uh, and I'm reminded by being here of a few words by Oscar Wilde, who, I mean, I appreciate will not be cited as often tonight, but I think it's uh, <laughs> worthwhile citing him here. He said in, I believe it was the importance of being earnest in that wonderful play of his, that there are occasions um, during which it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's obligations and one's minds. It then becomes um, uh, an application and it starts becoming enjoyable. And this is of course one such occasion. So I'm delighted to be here and delighted to be here alongside these two gentlemen. Um, so my journey doesn't differ all that much from Zakes's. Um, so I was also raised, obviously, in South Africa, and I appreciate for the South African audience among us that what I will say is not all that different from some of the experiences of some of the South Africans that are listening and watching. Um, but I grew up in a household raised by parents who were brought up during apartheid, and so you can imagine that the stories that they heard and the stories that you know were told to us were quite unimaginable. 
Um, and it was, you know, listening to stories like that, that, you know, I think awakened my political um, uh, so, sort of consciousness. Um, and so I developed as a young man um, with that or with those stories in my mind. I went to school, I went to university with those same stories and with very much those same ideas, albeit not in as ideological um, a mindset as I believe Zakes was. Um, but I went all through university with those same stories and it was those stories that I think laid the foundations for what I was to believe in the years that were to come. Um, so I was very much Marxist as well. So as soon as I understood that there was a term called Marxism, it was a term that I, of course, identified with because, you know, just like a fish doesn't know that it's in water, you kind of don't know, you know, some of the ideas that you believe until they're actually put forth to you to obviously understand them. So that's what I believed. Like most people, it was apartheid that really shaped the kind of individual that I was. Um, and so it was then that I sought to, in university, have these conversations with people who obviously did not experience the world that I did. Um, and from the people that I experienced it from, that being my parents, of course, and the experiences that shaped their outlook on the world. Um, and so it was then that I began having conversations with people. And then I started encountering people who obviously differed from me. And it perplexed me, pardon me, to understand and to hear them not sort of agree with the views that I was putting out because it seemed to me so apparent that what was happening was so cruel and so unjust that people ought to acquiesce to some of the things that I was saying if they would not outright agree with it. Um, but people pushed back. Um, and one of the people that pushed back is a very good friend of mine now who wasn't back then, but um, that's a story for another day. Um, he introduced me to Thomas Sowell. Uh, so it's great that you mentioned Thomas Sowell because I think he was a he was a great gateway into the kind of things that I believe today, about which I will obviously expand a little bit, uh, a bit later. But it was Thomas Sowell, and it was in particular his upbringing and his story that really appealed to me because there was a black guy who was brought up in the Jim Crow South of the United States who was born during the heights of the Great Depression. So this was a guy who experienced ravaging poverty and obviously relentless racism. And so this was a guy that I thought could relate to me. Um, and it was upon reading Thomas Sowell that he took a scalpel to everything that I believed. Um, and it's a wonderful book of his that I'll never forget. It's called Knowledge and Decisions that I read that I think it's one of the it's actually one of, I think, the best written books about knowledge and decisions in an economy that one can read. And it was obviously through reading that book by Thomas Sowell that I uh, landed on uh, Friedrich Hayek's lap um, and read The Use of Knowledge in Society, about which, again, I wish to talk a little bit. Um, but after I had encountered Friedrich Hayek, it was then that I started podcasting in Stellenbosch. So a few friends of mine and I got together and we started a podcast. And what I sought to do in that podcast was to just challenge some of the beliefs that I had and just to be able to talk to some people that I thought were inaccessible in university. Um, and it was during that podcasting journey of mine that I, you know, started having conversations with some interesting people, the likes of which are Professor Stan Duplessis, about which I will never tire to speak, who really, I think, sowed a seed of um, uh, doubt, skepticism and inquiry in me. Um, but I don't want to expand upon this too much and waste too much time. We will, of course, uh, I know Zeke's and the personality that he has, get into some of those um, <laughs> points and some of those questions. So I'll hand over to Peggy to tell us a bit more about himself. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. And thank you so much, everyone that has attended. Uh, my, what influenced my perspective on life is not necessarily one individual or academia. It's been a, a collective of great thinkers of which I've had the great privilege of getting access through throughout the course of my life up until this point. Uh, the seeds were started to be planted in my first economics class in high school. I had the great privilege of going to a good school called Boxburg High. And in the school I met quite an unusual Afrikaner by the name of Mr. Van Donder. Now, Mr. Van Donder was a cut above every other te teacher I knew from school. Um, the reason being is that he had a deep emotional connection towards his teachings. Uh, so deep, in fact, that he would shed tears when discussing the issues that the country faces. Now, one of the many great things that Mr. Van Dondo taught me is that I am an individual. At face value, this is a very simplistic statement, but I believe a great deal of people, South Africans, underappreciate their unique abilities, their potential, as, and most importantly, their own thoughts and default towards groupthink. I am an individual before, before I form any part of group. The values taught to me by my mother, my family, my friends, my acquaintances, religion and culture all add towards that individualism. Now with this perspective, 
I then started to read, particularly on the internet. I came across Mary Rothbard, as well as the Austrian school, Ludwig von Mises. But it was only when I was awarded an internship at the Institute of Race Relation, actually David, as well as Terence Corrigan, awarded me the internship, where my values, such as limited forms of government, free speech, freedom, as well as property rights were strengthened. Not only strengthened, but actually also challenged. Within the Institute, I met, I believe, the greatest thinkers in the country, not only in the country, in fact, but I believe in the world. <coughs> I had access to Dr. Anthea Jeffrey, whom, through her work, taught me that when judging public policy, it's not the intent of the policy, but rather the consequences. And it's this valuable lesson that I've learned that the policies implemented by our current government, policies such as NHI, policies such as employment equity, policies such as expropriation of our compensation, not only do, not, do they not achieve the stated intention, but bring disastrous consequences for every single person in this room, as well as every single person watching us today. I've also had conversations, bi-weekly conversations, in fact, with Dr. John Kane Berman, whom, through his previous work and his experiences, taught me in South Africa, and all South Africa, where one's destiny was defined by the color of their race. I also had the privilege of getting access to Ian Cruikshanks, whom I would have daily conversations, and every time I'd speak to Ian Cruikshanks about any release that came in the country, be it economic data, be it political matters, he would always answer back with this question. Okay, so how does this relate to the ordinary South Africans? And may both of their souls rest in peace. And lastly, I had um, access to, I believe, the greatest political thinker in the country, Dr. Franz Cornier. And through our work that we did by briefing clients, briefing ordinary South Africans throughout the country as well as internationally, we looked at social economic conditions in the country. Now, the thing about classical liberals, as well as I find amongst conservatives, of conservatives as well, is that we tend to be pessimistic about the outlook of the future. But it was through the work of Dr. Franz Cunier that, I, that optimism became instilled within me. The lesson I learned from Dr. Franz Cunier is that ordinary, hardworking South Africans are very sensible in their way of thinking. They want common things. They want education, proper education for their kids. They want employment opportunities. They don't view matters facing the country through a racial lens as much as our current government would like us to believe. It is these values that, um, through these individuals, that have strengthened my perspective on life and I hope to carry throughout my livelihood. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Peggy, right there for, you know, for the wonderful uh, relaying of your journey to, to us holding the values that you hold. But, you know,